Thanks very much. Sorry for the delay. I actually was at an Anglo results presentation just there where they said that they are going to issue legal proceedings against Michael Fingleton today. So uh, they're, they're, uh, they're issuing a plenary protective summons, which is seems to be a... They didn't explain what it was about, but it's a block that they've put in uh, that gets around the statute of limitations. But anyway, they've, they've issued, they're going to issue proceedings later today, and they're obviously trying to get around, around the statute of limitations, which um, is a, a six-year block, as far as I understand it, with regard to contractual issues. So they've obviously found something that they can uh, try and sue Michael Fingleton on, um, but they need to issue proceedings today. So hopefully find out later today. Hopefully you'll we'll be, we'll be able to read about it in the Irish Times tomorrow. Um, so as Park said, I'm author of two books and a finance correspondent in the Irish Times. So I've been covering the banking story for four years now and prior to that I worked in the Sunday Business Post where I was a news editor uh, I guess the timing of the books is interesting because the first book over there was written in 2006, published in 2006 I finished writing at the end of 2005 so it kind of somewhat predates all the all the, scan, uh, the crisis that happened and all, all that's emerged with the banks since then so I suppose the scandals in that book are in the halfpenny place to the scandals in this book but there you go. So just uh, I want to give a, just a brief, brief uh, history of Anglo it was founded in the 60s and later merged into City of Dublin Bank, both kind of fairly small banks. Anglo was a pretty tiny minnow in the market. And then it kind of developed and really only became, uh, Sean Fitzpatrick only became involved in it in the late 70s. He was originally in a bank called Irish Bank of Commerce. It's kind of confusing the structure. But in the late 70s, uh, Fitzpatrick, whose accountant was put in to run Anglo Irish Bank, 78, and he had been moved in from Irish Bank of Commerce which was itself a subsidiary of City of Dublin Bank. So, and he really uh, allowed him to kind of steer his own ship, and he developed Anglo uh, as he saw it really into a uh, what started off as a lender that would really do very small-time lending, lending in trade finance and guarantees and exports and bridge financing. So if you're a moving house and you wanted to sell your house and get a loan to buy the next house without the mortgage being drawn through, he would uh, provide that. And then gradually... He got more and more into property lending, and it was specifically secondary properties or investment properties for professionals, the likes of doctors, lawyers, dentists, accountants, for those kind of people who wanted to buy their own office space or to have buy-to-let properties. And he saw a, a niche in that market and really uh, developed that. And then, I guess, as a, a sign of um, Anglo's uh, strengths and, and how it rose under Fitzpatrick, it actually took over its parents in the mid-'80s. And it's around... Uh, it was in 1987 that the Anglo name appeared on the stock market. And then a short time later, it took over the bank that Fitzpatrick originally worked in, Irish Bank of Commerce. And that, that acquisition actually is very much was, was uh, instrumental in Anglo getting into property developers in the property development space. And Irish Bank of Commerce would have had a lot of clients whose names you'd be familiar with today. They had Paddy Kelly, Jerry Gannon, uh, and the Bailey Brothers. So Anglo was kind of in the property space, but its takeover of Irish Bank of Commerce really pushed it into the, the space where it lending to developers, builders, uh, many of the names who became very wealthy in recent years and then bust in, in the current time. And the bank was also very active in the early 90s. I suppose it, given that it was, it was in the property space, it became very active in developing pubs and hotels and it lent to the likes of the O'Dwyer brothers who were behind some of the pubs and the super pubs like Café and Seine, Brick for the Border and some of those properties. But... Anglo really spotted a niche in the 90s when the property market started rising. It saw that it, 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 was, it would support developers and builders from its relationship with our to its relationships uh, in Irish Bank of Commerce. And at a time when AIB and Bank of Ireland didn't really want to have anything to do with the property market, they still thought it was very high risk. And I guess AIB and Bank of Ireland would have been regarded in the 90s as quite sleepy to react to big changes that were taking place in the property market, whereas Anglo had these guys and... Um, there were a lot of developer clients who were sitting on very large undeveloped land banks. Uh, again, very familiar names now, given what the property market went through, the boom it went through. It was kind of bankrolling the likes of Jerry Gannon in North Dublin, West Dublin, Sean Riley, a cabin developer, South Dublin, Joe Riley, who went on to build the Dundrum Shopping Centre, and then had Jerry Barrett in Galway, um, and then eventually got into major investment properties, the likes of Derek Quinlan and all the money that he gathered from his, his clients and property investors. And then internationally, the likes of uh, Sean Mulryan's company, Ballymore, uh, which develops is very prominent in the UK and in Eastern Europe, and Treasury Holdings, which is um, Europe, 
China, Sweden, France, its, it's, it's, it's uh, developments are very international. So I guess when Anglo spotted this market and saw how much money there was to be made in it and the property, mar- property value started rising, that's when AIB and Bank of Ireland started to react. They saw uh, Anglo making very big profits and uh, there's a famous quote from Michael Buckley where he said, you know, Anglo joined us for breakfast, but now they're eating our lunch. Um, so they had wanted to fight back and get back some of that business. So 2003, 2004, you see AIB starting to react and Buckley set up what he called a win-back team where he said, I want you to find out what Anglo are doing to get all this business that's making them so much money and their investors so much money from the stock uh, market and w- want you to replicate that. So... AIB set on a course under Michael Buckley to start tack- uh, taking in more of the property business that Anglo uh, was doing. So in hindsight, it was a bit of a race to the bottom. Uh, bankers were willing to lend more and more money on riskier and riskier projects. And I think the influence of the foreign banks in Ireland, the UK-owned banks or the Scottish banks, as, uh, as it's really known, um, you have the likes of Bank of Scotland Ireland, which was run by Mark Duffy, uh, and it was owned by Halifax Bank of Scotland. And Ulster Bank, which was owned by Royal Bank of Scotland, became more and more aggressive like AIB, to compete with uh, Anglo. And Bank of Ireland was a lot slower to move into that space, but the current chief executive of Bank of Ireland, Richie Buckley, would have been quite proactive under chief executive Brian Goggin to actually get some of the property business that Anglo had. So really you had what Peter Nyberg, who investigated the banking crisis, he described it as herd mentality and groupthink, and the other banks were trying to keep up. And, fo- and so... Anglo was leading the herd and the others followed. Um, Nyberg used these terms to describe not just how the banks behaved, but how many different aspects and people in Irish society behaved as well, where we were all kind of swept up in the boom that was happening and the money to be made from it. And certainly people um, would take issue with that, and a lot of people now who are struggling to pay for their homes and the residential mortgages um, didn't get involved in the investment property and didn't, didn't get involved in speculative lending are now having to face the pain that um, this group think and herd mentality created. So to give you an idea of just the level of borrowing that took place and that was a uh, heavy concentration in property, at the peak of the boom, for every five euros that the banks had lent out, three related to property. So I think that that statistic on its own really describes the bubble uh, that um, was created in Ireland by the likes of Anglo and the others following them. It was a huge concentration. There was far too many eggs in one basket. And um, as we've seen now, the crash is, is, is a, result, a result of that. And one of the areas that the banks got involved in, they were so frantically trying to lend money out, they created what they called the, the dreaded equity release. And this is where Anglo and the other banks, what they did was, well, they said to the developer, you made so much money on the last development, you know, all of the houses sold out on the sales weekend. I mean, we all remember the queues of people and people camping out and sleeping in their cars to try and buy a property. So the bank said, well, you've made so much money from selling those properties that you haven't even built. Let's take those paper profits and assume that that's the cash element of the next deal. So there's no cash in from that, but don't worry, they've all been sold, so it's fine. So let's, let's put that money into the next deal. And so the next deal uh, had no cash in it at all. And if you do that a number of times and you do that across your book, and the banks had a huge concentration amongst a very small number of developers, that you were really piling debt upon debt upon debt, and the cash element is never... Uh, taken out. There's no cash ever taken off the table. So you create this house of cards, really, and that practice in banking explains the ghost estates that we now have, the 2,000-odd ghost estates, where you have half-built derelict houses that have not been sold, but the banks felt, well, the market isn't going to to collapse. It's going to be a soft landing. Everything will be fine. So um, uh, they felt that, well, it's not an issue. The money will always come off the table at some point. So this left the banks kind of terribly exposed in the event of a property crash. Um, and I just want to describe a little bit more about Anglo's culture because I think it really does point a lot to the kind of bank it was and also how it worked with customers. They had what they call this relationship banking model where it was staying close to your customer. You know exactly what they want. If there's problems on their building sites or with their property investments, you know before AIB would or Bank of Ireland would because you're a small team of people, you're kind of in the customer's face all the time. So they actually thought that they'd broken the banking mold. And this invariably meant that they would work with them day and entertain them at night and on corporate hospitality trips. And I think it's kind of significant, the culture of the institution, because 
bankers themselves in Anglo liked it because it gave them an idea as to what kind of customer they were dealing with and you know everything from how they would hold their drink, how they would behave when they were having a good time, if a good looking waitress walked by, all of these things you know, uh, really played uh, on the bankers' minds as to whether they were a good or a bad customer and whether they should be lending money to them. And also access to clients was, was crucial as well. And this is, this is where we have this massive spending in golf, apart from the fact that Sean Fitzpatrick was a golfing fanatic. Golf put Anglo in a position where it could meet its customers and get to know them well. And some of the figures that I have in the book, I mean, the, the banks spent more than two million euro on golf in three years between 2006 and 2008. And also they got involved in golf competitions. And this expenditure on golf balls alone was 208,000 euro, which is an astonishing figure. And aside from that, they also did trips. There were ski trips. There was a famous trip on the Orient Express where they brought developers from Paris to Venice um, and brought their partners as well. And again, to give you an idea of some of the expenditure on corporate entertainment that the bank would engage in, in 2008, this is the year of the bank guarantee, Anglo spent 21,000 on Manchester United tickets, 19,000 on Chelsea season tickets, 42,000 on tickets for Six Nation away games, and 9,000 to take clients in the US to the Boston Red Sox baseball game. So that's the kind of spending they were doing. And then gifts to customers in Christmas 2008, three months after the bank guarantee, they spent 53,000 on hampers and wine. And they used to do an annual thing where they'd bring uh, the, the, some of the valued customers, a lot of the valued customers, and their kids to the Panto, the Gaty. And they spent 24,000 euros uh, on Panto tickets in December 2008. Great, but, uh, just ask, is there, was there a psychological profile on what were developers? I think it was very simply based around whether they could work with the individual or not and if they made demands of the developer, the developer would meet their demands and the problem was is that the relationship banking model was seen to be well you know you can make a lot of money from customers by staying close to them but as we've now seen they got too close to them uh, and the relationship model was far too close. For example in the Quinn case we're now seeing in the courts that the bank lent more than two billion to Quinn um, to allow him to meet the margin calls on this investment that he made on the shares. So his investment was collapsing in value and the bank was lending to him. And there was that incredibly close relationship between senior Anglo lenders. I don't know whether there's a psychological profile profiling done in the bank of developers, but it's just who they knew and who they liked best and who they could get on with. It's, I think it was that simple. So... Um, this is an older picture of Mr. Fitzpatrick and Jerry Murphy, who was chairman up until um, the late 90s, in fact. He was there. This is the chap who ran City of Dublin Bank through the 70s and 80s. Uh, really, he's, uh, Fitzpatrick was his protege of sorts. Um, uh, this picture, I think, is around the time of 88, uh, 89, after the bank had um, listed on the stock market. So just to describe what happened in the market, I'm not going to spend too much time on the graphs and the slides in relation to economic data, but... I think where the lines go will give you an idea of what happened. So you had the boom in house prices, and um, with house prices quadrupling, and Anglo had many clients in development, so they did exceptionally well. And as I said earlier, a lot of the developers would have had land banks dating back to before this graph in the early 90s. So they would have been sitting on options on land as well as land itself that they would have bought from farmers, and ready to move. And when the property market went where it went, uh, these figures comparison to Spain and the UK, they made a lot of money. And as a result, the Anglo share price soared. Anglo share price rose by 2,000% in seven years. So just to explain it in kind of simple money terms, if you invested five grand in Anglo in 2000, you'd be sitting on 100 grand in 2007. So if you go back to the herd mentality and the group think, and the naysayers in the early noughties coming out saying, oh, this won't last. After seven years of growth, with that amount of money to be made, I think it would convince even the most sceptical that this was a bank that had done things and was doing things differently. And given where the share price went, the value of the bank went from about 600 million in 2000 to 13 billion in 2007. I think people felt that, well, they're onto a winner here and I'm gonna put my money with them, both in terms of depositing with them and, and buying their shares. Here you have, uh, this slide is to do with house completion. So again, it reflects the increase in prices. And this would be um, all of the new, new bills by developers and builders. And the figure reached, here it's a little bit late, uh, 2006 is the peak of the market. 
where there was 90,000, just over 90,000 new houses built. And just to put that in comparison, that's twice what would be built of new buildings that we built in the, in the UK, which is 14 times the size of Ireland's population. So it gives you an idea of the level of the, talked about the, the, the lending boom or the credit boom uh, in Ireland and the banking boom. Well, this is the construction boom. This, this is the, the slide that shows that. And again, you know, everyone felt that we really hit a new paradigm and things had changed with immigration and that you know, there would always be a demand for houses. So 90,000 new houses in one year was not regarded as, as, as a bubble. It was regarded as something that was simply responding to the needs of the country and people needed homes. This is uh, Anglo's profits. As you'll see, this is their own from their own report. So this is, what, this is what they reported every year. So again, the figures, this is 2007. So you can see through the, through the noughties, it, uh, it really soared. And this would have been David Drum's first year as chief executive. And that was, uh, he took over from Fitzpatrick. So again, once he took over, he said he wanted to double profits in five years. Uh, and he did it. It soared up. That's 1.2 billion. So that was... They reported that figure in November 2007 after the credit crunch. So again, the figures show that the uh, profitability of the bank followed the other markets and followed the growth in the share price as well. So this is David Drum and Tom Brown. Um, Tom Brown used to, was head of the Irish business. So this is them presenting uh, the results. And Tom Brown would have been instrumental in doing a lot of the property development uh, in the Republic. And David Drum really... Uh, uh, put the accelerator down, pedal down, and uh, took the bank to new places in terms of growth. So this is the boom in Irish bank lending. You can see the increases. The, the light blue is the Irish banks, and the dark blue is the IFSC banks. So again, huge increase in lending by the Irish banks, where um, total assets, the balance sheets, assets are loans and other, mostly loans, uh, the balance sheets of the Irish banks are 700 billion um, in 2008. And there you have Anglo's loan book. It's soaring again. Last three are uh, David Drum's years. So you're seeing a massive increase in lending by the bank. Sorry, it goes back to that, that figure there. And uh, it's a massive increase. Uh, the lending, it goes from um, 6 billion in 1999 to 30, 33 billion in 2005 and 73 billion in 2008. So it's a massive increase. It's, that's the credit bubble there. So where does the money come from that they borrow out to customer, lend out to customers? Um, the Irish banks, traditionally in the late 90s, you would have had, for every euro you had in deposit, you'd have roughly about a euro on, uh, out on loan. And that was the traditional banking. Yeah. You pay for deposits and you charge for loans. Very simple. Um, and that changed. Uh, so what you saw is the cheap and easy access to funding to the bond markets and borrowing from other banks and allowed banks here to lend out money more cheaply and freely been in the euro after 19, 1999, removed the currency risk from the, for the, from the bank's own borrowing, and it gave them access to vast pools of borrowings across Europe. So the main banks in Europe that would have been lending to the Irish banks were the UK banks, and then you would see uh, the French and German banks, and then the Italian banks, but mostly the UK. Uh, so when we hear about bondholders, those are the people lending money to the banks, and those in, in when Ireland entered the euro, an Anglo would have borrowed from those, uh, those banks to, to lend on to customers. So the gap between loans and deposits, which didn't really exist in the late 90s, uh, changed completely and it rose to two to one. So for every euro you had on deposit, uh, you had two euro on loan. So that gap was filled by borrowing from bondholders and other banks. Um, and in Anglo's case, it was extraordinary growth in borrowing, reflecting the growth across the other banks. They had borrowed uh, 100 million uh, from bondholders in 1999, and this reached uh, 23 billion um, by the peak of the bank in 2007. So, uh, borrowing from other banks soared, um, and the other problem for Anglo was they thought that the deposits that they had were very sticky. Uh, in other words, they, would, they wouldn't be drawn in a hurry, withdrawn in a hurry. Um, but they left pretty quickly when the crisis hit, and those uh, corporate depositors would have been kind of multinationals here, insur insurance companies, pension fund companies, the like. So that's the uh, increase in Irish bank borrowing. And then you have the crash. So property values start to fall from 2007, 2008, and they really start to nosedive in 2008 and 2009. Um, and this is the Anglo building, some of you may know, in the North Keys. It's kind of become a symbol for the crash here. And it was built by, or half built, by um, property developer Liam Carroll, who actually wasn't a long-term customer of Anglo, but he won the competition 
to build the building and uh, Anglo provided 60 million to do that that, was, that, that cost 60 million that you see there um, it kind of stands as a post-apocalyptic monument to Irish excess um, I saw uh, I remember a columnist I met from the UK and we were discussing it it was kind of like the, the monument in, in Hiroshima where you have the, you know, the hall under the, the, where the site of the bomb site so perhaps it's not a, a pretty crude and, and unfair analogy to draw but it's kind of it's become our symbol of the crash so property prices falling they're down Anglo said there an hour ago at their presentation that the market is down 65% um, so it's quite a drop um, this is a slide from the Department of, of, of Finance. House prices are down about 60% and commercial property down 70 to 80%, but the development land, which is, which is much riskier for the bank, is down about 90%, and in many cases, particularly outside the cities, it's reverted back to agricultural values. Um, and when you think about it, that Anglo has 80% of its loan book in property, um, more than 20%, a fifth, more than a fifth of their book was in this high-risk land in development. So if you think about the bank at the peak of the market, 73 billion in loans in 2008, it just had 4 billion set aside to cover potential losses, uh, which isn't enough. Um, and I mean, you could argue, well, whose fault is that? Well, if you look at the Basel rules, which are the rules that all international banks follow in terms of how much they need to set aside in capital, Basel rules have been changed, so they're now saying that the minimum is four times what it was originally. So if you think about it, if you were to apply that, go back in time and apply that, the banks should not have grown more than a quarter of their eventual size. So the banks just got too big. And it wasn't just an Irish problem. It was, um, it was across Europe and indeed across the world, in, uh, in particularly in the US. So we kind of get to the, the nub of the talk, which is the cost to the state of all this and Anglo's role in Ireland's economic collapse. I suppose the best way to describe what happened and to look at Anglo's role in it is what actually triggered the economic collapse and whether Anglo was responsible. I spoke earlier about how it led the, uh, the race to the bottom, as we can now see what it was, um, and it drove all the other banks down with them. But on the night of the guarantee itself, September 29th, 30th, 2008, Anglo had run out of money that day, and the share price had collapsed almost in half. So that's kind of like a megaphone the market saying this bank is gone we, it's absolutely tanked and it had run out of cash it had gone to the central bank looking for money so um, if you look at what happened on that night the government didn't think it was dealing with a solvency crisis I mean, they didn't feel or weren't told by the regulator that the banks had enough cash in reserve to meet possible losses from a property crash and they felt they were dealing with this liquidity crisis the collapse after the collapse of Lehman Brothers and Wall Street because the markets where the banks borrowed as I said half their money uh, those markets froze. So Anglo was the trigger for the government's decision to do something on that night. And as we've seen, Brian Cowan has said that they needed to give a kind of one signal, big signal to the market that they were fixing this problem. Um, so uh, Anglo would need more the following day uh, after running out of cash and after getting the three odd billion from the central bank on the 29th. So the government felt, well, Anglo has run, run out of cash. The other banks are going to run out of cash uh, if we don't do something because there was this domino effect uh, and investors weren't really discerning between good and bad banks. And they were kind of painted the Irish banks as too exposed to property uh, and also uh, heavily borrowed in the international and the wholesale markets, the money markets. So the government went too far. The, the government wanted the silver bullet solution to ease market concerns. And most people who know about this kind of thing in official circuits have said that a guarantee was required. And you have the likes of Patrick Conan in his report the OECD saying, yes, you use a guarantee, and certainly a guarantee is one of the tools in the toolbox you take out when you want to repair a banking system that has gone bust. Um, but it was far too broad, uh, this guarantee. It, it pushed the liabilities covered by the state, insured by the state, to $440 billion. And the state was only, our economic ag output at that stage was in the order of $170, $180 billion. So clearly it was a lot to put on the shoulders of the state, um, so if the government had instituted a more narrow guarantee, um, it could have uh, given the government now more options to burn other bondholders, senior bondholders. Because the guarantee is in place, they're protected, and we're protected um, under the extended guarantee as well. So this increased the cost of the bailout to the state. So this slide shows the, the holes in the Irish banks and what we've, how we fill them. If you see the biggest is Anglo. It's lumped in with Irish Nationwide under IBRC, Irish Bank Resolution Corporations, it's now known. 
So the biggest fall was at Angles, 29.3, and they've said that it'll rise to 34 if the market doesn't recover for 10 years. Just earlier there today at the presentation, the bank said again that it expects the figure for Anglo to be in the order of about 25 to 28 billion. And then the other figures, AIB, which is supposed to be the next worst in terms of absolute numbers, is in the order of about 20, close to 20 billion we pumped into them. And uh, Irish Nationwide 5.4, Bank of Ireland 4.2, EBS 2.4, um, and Irish Life and Permanent, as of yesterday, has gone to 4 billion from 2.7. So of those, we own AIB, EBS, we own Irish Life and Permanent, we own Anglo-Irish Nationwide, and we own 15% of Bank of Ireland. Uh, and the bill is 63 billion. The situation Bank of Ireland is, again, as I said earlier, they were slower to get into the property market, and that maybe saved them from government control, because um, they required less from the state, and they could manage to get it, these uh, US investors in last year, who took 35% of the company. So if you look at the guarantee and the night of the guarantee, a 700 billion banking system compared to the economic value of the state, 170 billion, and that's down to about 150 now, really the guarantee put the state on the hook for the bank's losses and the state couldn't cope with those losses. When the size of the hole at Anglo emerged in 2010, which was a month before the blank guarantee ended, it was really a case of you know, the markets got very concerned and said, well, what is the figure for Anglo? We don't know. It seems to be rising all the time, and the government were unable to put a figure on it until September 2010. And by that stage, the banking guarantee, the two-year guarantee, had ended. And under the guarantee, the Irish banks had borrowed $30 billion. So when they couldn't borrow to repay that $30 billion, the only place they could turn to was the central bank, uh, two places, Frankfurt and Dublin, the Irish Central Bank and the European Central Bank. So what you saw is banks' borrowings for the European Central Bank and the Irish Central Bank soared. And that really spooked the ECB. And they said, we didn't, you know, we didn't expect it to go as high as this. And although the authorities here would say, well, we warned them, we let them know from the Greek crisis blowing up in May 2010 that there was a problem coming down the tracks. And uh, when that bank borrowing soars, the top line there shows how much it increases by um, in two months, Anglo's borrowings from the central bank went from about 14 billion to 34 billion, and that was really that had the alarm bells uh, sounding in Frankfurt and said, "We need to do something here." And that was the trigger for the ECB coming in and putting the government under pressure. And the ECB the view in the ECB was there is more black holes in the Irish banks that you haven't identified because clearly you're just grappling with Anglo and you've been dealing with that for a time. Um, so. Again, that spike, that was the trigger. Talk about another trigger, that's the trigger that prompts the bailout of the country. So you had the bailout of the banks in 2008, the state couldn't cope with that, and ultimately the next trigger then is this, the increase in central bank borrowing costs. So uh, the government feared at that time that the ECB could increase the rate it was charging on emergency loans to Anglo. That was what it was most concerned about. You hear talk now about uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, the central, European Central Bank President, threatening uh, Ireland and some say the fear was that they would withdraw the funding from the Irish banks I'm not sure they could have done that but what they could have done is put pressure on the government by increasing the charge increasing the interest rate on that so this is what led to the bailout program and the decision to provide 67.5 billion in bailout loans to uh, the Irish government so again Anglo really was the trigger for that the other banks were following in as well, like AIB had borrowed on emergency loans from the central bank as well. So unrelated to property lending, Anglo did some wild things. This is Mr Fitzpatrick leaving the Garda station in Bray after his first arrest. He's been arrested a second time. So Anglo, some of you have been following, know now that the issues around that are loans to directors, which were provided mostly to buy shares in the bank. They were initially non-recourse, which meant the directors didn't have to pay the loans back and um, now they've been changed to recourse and a lot of those directors are in severe trouble. David Drum has applied for bankruptcy in the US, Sean Fitzpatrick has applied for bankruptcy in Ireland, they've filed for bankruptcy in both cases and then Sean Quinn, their biggest borrower, has filed for bankruptcy as well. He tried to do it in Belfast but the, uh, he was blocked by the bank and he's now bankrupt here. Um, then the issue of Fitzpatrick's loans hidden in Irish Nationwide at the time Anglo wrote up its annual accounts. And then uh, I suppose one of the most incredible aspects of that is that emerged in December 2008. And even though the government had stepped in to guarantee the bank, it left Fitzpatrick and Drum in place in their jobs after the guarantee. 
So the scandal about Fitzpatrick's loans uh, increased the pressure on the bank and on the government, and it eventually led to pressure on the deposits, and that's when um, the government had to step in and nationalise the bank in January 2009. So um, since then, uh, investigations and arrests are, have arisen over uh, things that the bank did in 2008 when its back was against the wall. We've now discovered that Anglo was cooking the books with dodgy deposits from Irish Life and Permanent in 2008 to make their uh, balance sheet and make the books look better than they actually were. And that was, uh, we're talking about triggers, another trigger for the nationalisation of the bank back in 2009. And now we're seeing uh, through the courts this week and last and in international courts the battle with the Quinn family. Uh, they owe the bank almost 2.9 billion. Uh, they're the biggest, after the loans have been transferred to NAMA, they're the biggest borrowers at what is now Irish Bank Resolution Corporation. And uh, the bank is pursuing them internationally and here to try and recover as much of that as they can. And again, most of those loans relates to his decision to invest in the bank in, uh, in the period up until he was buying right up into 2008 um, when the share price was collapsing. And the fear at Anglo was that if he couldn't afford to meet the losses on his investment, that would force the brokers who held the shares to dump them, share price would fall, depositors would see that, they'd get spooked, they'd pull their money out, then you have a run on the bank, and then the bank collapses. So the bank in 2008 decided to get 10 customers together when it couldn't sell Sean Quinn's shares in the markets, got 10 customers together, gave them 450 million in loans, got them to buy 10% of the bank in the secret deal, and uh, that 450 million is gone now. So this is the uh, fallout and the end of the bank, the name, kind of symbolic day in April 2011, an Anglo signage being removed from the bank's branches. And this is a photograph taken of the, the building in St. Stephen's Green. It's, I think it says a lot. Uh, it doesn't take away that anger that people feel towards the bank because we're still paying for it. And the current talks are about trying to push out the cost of that. So these promissory notes, these IOUs that have been written up by the government back in, two, back in 2010 when we didn't have the cash to pay for Anglo, they said, well, here, here's a promissory note. It's an IOU. We'll pay you over a long period. The cost of that is very high every year, and the government wants to reduce that because it needs to get to this target deficit by 2015 to show the markets that it's, we're getting back on our feet again. So it's a small amount of the debt that the country has, the debt problems that the country has, but it's kind of trimming at the edges. But it should, um, it seems to be, uh, Patrick Conan has said that it's likely to be successful. So the payment is due on Saturday for 3.1 billion. And they're saying, well, instead of paying that in cash, which would be a drain on the state, let's do another IOU, we'll give them a government bond, and say, this is 2025, we'll pay you back in 2025. And IBRC takes that instead of the 3 billion in cash and goes to the European Central Bank and exchanges for cash. So um, that's the whole exercise that's being done in private at the moment. And then the longer term exercise that's being done is to come up with a whole new system to restructure the rest of the 30 billion that we have to pay. So to summarize, um, I'd say that Anglo drove the other banks into reckless lending and because they saw the spoils that were to be made from that. And I think they're as guilty though of, of uh, on reckless lending charges because they, um, uh, they followed Anglo. And also Anglo was the trigger for the decision to guarantee the banks and also the trigger, or at least the biggest reason, for the ECB forcing the government to take the bailout from the EU and the IMF. So this was a bank that uh, started out as a small Dublin lender and it soared on the property market and the property boom. And it eventually became too big to fail and then too big to bail and ultimately too rotten to save. Um, so you can see here in front of you, but it's a gratuitous plug for my book, which you can either buy or borrow from here. And uh, hopefully there's loads of copies in the library. I can take some questions if anyone has anything they'd like to ask me. Uh, I've uh, two questions. Um, just go back to 2008, the uh, banks uh, came in to see the government. Yeah. First question is, did the banks actually uh, lie to the government? And the second question is, in 2008, could the government have burned the bond holders? In 2008? Yeah. Um, I'd say, did the banks lie when they came into the, to, um, I mean, that, that's a question I've asked when I ask, when I meet bankers now who are there, and I say, were you lying, or were you just deluded? And I think it's a bit of both. I think in Angus' case, there was an element of deceit about it. Certainly from my research in the book, uh, 
there were managers within Anglo who could see in June 2008, there was a big board meeting in June 2008, uh, Anglo did down in Cork, and there was a presentation made to the board, how bad is our, is our property look? And certainly at that point, they knew they had major problems. And I mentioned there about equity release. Uh, the other issue that was, uh, was a real signal that there was problems was the, um, is interest roll-up. They weren't even paying their interest bill through 2008, and that was widely known. Some of the big developers were just not paying back the loans at all. So I think that in Angle's case, they probably knew they had major problems in the loan in their own book. But again, as was widely felt in the market, that it was a you know this was a blip or a soft landing. It wasn't going to be a major crash. So I think they were deluded as well. So I think it's a bit of both. They were lying. They were deluded. Um, I think in the case of AIB and Bank of Ireland, who went into government on the night and said. I mean, they went in to say, you need to nationalise Anglo and Irish Nationwide. It's not, we're not the problem here. Mm -hmm. But we will, be, we will have a major problem if you don't take these out. Because international investors who give us money, who lend money to us, uh, are saying, what's the story with Anglo and Nationwide? We know they're bust. They're exposed to the property market. 80% of their book, loan book, is to the property market. Why aren't you doing something about that? But I think AIB, in particular AIB, did not know the extent of the problems within that bank. I mean, look at the figures back in that chart in terms of the bailout. I mean, AIB is not far behind Bank of uh, is not far behind Anglo in terms of what it's cost. And in fact, this, during during the boom years, this developers would say you could get a loan from Anglo in a week, but you could get it in two weeks from AIB. So a lot of them went to AIB. So I think AIB knew they had the problems there, and I think they were deluded. I don't think they were lying. I just right. think they were deluded as to the extent of the problems. Could they have burnt the bondholders in September 2008? Yeah, they could have. If you apply a guarantee like this, kind of throw this massive blanket over the system and say, we stand over everything that the banks have and we will pay the liabilities, no problem. Uh, you immediately limit your options as to what you can do with those, those, uh, those bondholders. I mean, I think people, the, the issue of bondholders and who owes what is, it's like a queue, if you can imagine like that. Who's first to take the losses? Shareholders take losses because they take a punt. And the view is, is, well, who's next in the queue to take losses if, if a business goes bust? The subordinated bondholders will get paid a bit more than the senior, so they're taking a higher risk. They're next. The decision on the night of the guarantee to include some of them in the guarantee is astonishing. Absolutely astonishing from, from my perspective. If you look at, they decided to, to guarantee the dated subordinated bondholders, and what that means is those are guys who have a, a, lo a loan note or an IOU from the bank saying that they're paid at a certain point. They get paid a good interest rate, like 10, 11 percent in some cases. Uh, so those guys should have been burnt, and yet they were included. Now, if you look at the advice that Merrill Lynch gave on the night in the run-up to the guarantee, they raised the the, pos the a possible problem. They said, "Well, there's what they call cross default, and what that is is that somebody could have a subordinated bond and they could have a senior bond. If I have a subordinated bond and you burn me on that, I can call you in on this." So Merrill Lynch warned it's not as easy as that. So I think that that might have influenced the thinking on the night. But yeah, you could have what you could have done on the night is you could have said, right, we're going to take out Anglo and Irish Nationwide and nationalise them. We're going to put a guarantee in place, but only for the depositors at AIB and Bank of Ireland, and we'll only guarantee any new bonds you issue, and you apply all sorts of um, terms and conditions to those bonds. But, and as we've seen, uh, Brian Cowan had said in this lecture that he gave in the university in the US, was, um, he said, we wanted a big bank solution. If you don't know the extent of your problems in your banks, you can't do that. And what, uh, what surprised me is there was an admission by Kevin Cardiff, who's now gone off to that job in Europe. Um, he was head of banking in the Department of Finance. He, he was asked after the crisis, said, at what point did you realize you had a problem here or that you didn't know the extent of your problems in the banks. And he said, when we could no longer rely on the f financial regulator for information, and we had to rely on the bank's own uh, advisors. And that was Goldman Sachs in the case of Irish Nation, and in the case of, I can't remember who it was in the end, right? but the, the government, uh, for a senior government official to admit that, and this was prior to the guarantee they were calling on Goldman Sachs, we did not know the extent of the problems at, uh, because the regulator wasn't giving us didn't have the information available that we had to turn to their own advisors. Knowing that now, and even knowing that then, if you realise that then, why then would you uh, agree to a guarantee? Granted, Cardiff isn't making the decision, but he's there on the night. So, 
Yes, you could have gone and seen the bond deals on the night. Yeah. Would the ECB have let you? That's another question. That was, the, that was, my, that was, my, that was Brian Cowan, that article that he gave on uh, States a few days ago, or mm. recently. He, he said that's the common factor, that you, you could, even now, he was saying right across from 2008 yeah. till now, uh, you'd have a problem for him. Well, this and the senior bondholders of accounts, uh, this subordinate, we burn subordinate bondholders, but it's not nearly enough to cover this bill. Um, so the senior bondholders are really the only ones that could have been burned to, to save on that. And uh, no senior bondholder in a, in a European in a, in a eurozone bank has been burned. Yeah. They refuse to allow it because they feel if it happened, it would unravel. It would lead to another Lehman Brothers type tsunami across yeah. the European banking system. The one country that has burned senior bondholders is Denmark. They allowed it. But in that case, they only allowed it for a couple of small banks. Like, as I said, we had six banks, and three of them got far too big, much bigger than the state, uh, than the state could cope with uh, when the crash came. So but the Danish model is interesting. They, it, the markets did react, and they did ask for more money when they were lending to the Danish banks after they did that. But that calmed down again. But we've, we haven't seen a major bank in Europe both, well, it's definitely not in the Eurozone, but outside the Eurozone, I haven't seen a major European bank burn senior bondholders. Um, thank you very much. Um, going back, Lehman Brothers collapsed in, in the middle of 07. The, the middle, September 08. Yeah, okay, yeah, but the, the market was beginning to go down from the middle of 07. Yeah. This was 15th of September 08. Mm -hmm. But I'm bringing it up to date last weekend that there was a big debate in, in Frankfurt on sovereign debt debate uh, and the whole issue around sovereign debt and then the bailout of countries. Now, we're one of the three program, uh, countries on an IMF program. Christine Lagarde, the managing director of the IMF, when asked the night, of, just on the day of the signing of the uh, prosperity and the new, the, the latest in Greece, was asked, do you think it will go through? And she said, yes, on condition that private investors pension funds and bankers take a haircut. Mm. What I'm picking up since I was on a few weeks ago is that 75, a lot of the pension funds lost 75% of their money. Some of them had credit default swaps. Mm -hmm. Now, is this not, you know, the sovereign debt, we're, we're now producing an, an IOU with the sovereign debt of 25 years. We're now introducing sovereign bonds to be into pension funds and annuities. Now, are we not just, you know, switching credit around and no real money? You know, are we not doing exactly the same as what's been going on in the last five years? If you even listen to Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, exactly the same debate and language is around the property mm -hmm. in the States as it is here. You're now hearing it also from China. So I don't think anyone has learned anything. And I don't think, I, I think all of this is going around and nobody knows it's going on. Well, yes is the answer. It's all paper going around, like it's credit again. Mm. Uh, the difference being is it's it's sovereign borrowing rather than private borrowing or state borrowing or um, uh, company borrowing. So, yeah, it's it's to do like the whole restructuring of the promissory notes is just you know, if you have a mortgage and it's thirty years, if you push it to forty years, you're going to pay more over forty years, but you'll pay less every year. That's what they're doing. It's that simple, and they're doing it. Uh, with paper, with IOUs, with loans. It's not, there's no cash to pay for uh, this. Um, and the whole aim is that they need to separate the decision on the line of the guarantee. State banks won. They need to separate it again. Um, and this is that process that they're trying to do. They're trying to take out a chunk of this, so half this figure, take it out and get it off the state's balance sheet and do something else with it. Um, now, the ideal situation would be is to go and get agreement from the European authorities to say, listen, just give us a loan from the EFSF, and instead of giving it to us, just give it to IBRC or give it, you know, or, or better still, let's let private investors come in and they take it. But that's not going to happen. So, really, you're right. It's the. It is. I gather what someone said across here. The guy was a small print of the big deal that hardly anyone found out until the end of the day was that the priority orders is such that the IMF get 100% big net. Mm. The ECB get 100%. Even the EIB gets 100%. Mm. And the South and the very end. 
So who would actually put money in a settlement debt, considering most of the central banks actually do have most of their balance sheets in a settlement debt? Well, not into Greece. They, they wouldn't do it at the moment, but that's what they're trying to do in Ireland. If they separate the state and bank debt, they're trying to get people in to start lending to the state again. But people don't want to. Investors don't want to come into and buy Irish debt just yet because they want to be sure that Ireland will recover by the time it says it recover. It will get the deficit down to 20, uh, by 2015. So Honan, Noonan and, and the rest of the government are saying, well, if we do this with the Anglo promissory note, it will ease some of that burden and show those investors that Ireland is recovering and that you can lend to us and that you will get it back. You're saying there's a 60% chance of default when you look at the risk assessment? It's a high risk, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's high risk, but I mean, you know, the, the talk of a second bailout is it going to be a second bailout for Ireland? Um, you know, I wrote a piece in the paper today, and you could argue that what they're trying to do with the Anglo note is a second bailout because they're trying to get money from a different fund or more money from the same fund in, in terms of the um, ESM, uh, the longer term bailout fund. Uh, over a much longer period, so it kind of is a second bailout. But yes, is your answer? It's with paper. Have they learned a lesson? I hope so. They're just they're doing the same thing, but it's with sovereign paper instead of uh, bank credit. Would it not be better to accept the uh, second bailout if you're getting a better interest rate? I mean, obviously, if you go back to the market, you're going to have to pay a higher rate to attract private investors or other yeah. investors into like yes, Irish sovereign debt. Would it not be better off just accepting the bailout because it's, it's at a lesser rate? Well, no, and what they're doing is, is and again, we don't have the de full details of what they're doing in the background right now, uh, both in terms of the payment due on Saturday and, and the rest of the payments due until 2031. Uh, but Honan said at the Rockless Committee the other day, he said, it's got to be less than the bailout fund money, or otherwise we're just going to take the bailout fund money. Mm -hmm. They're seeing that they would... Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah it's just related to the IBRC. Um, does it have like a... Time span that it's allowed to exist for, and at the end of it, it has to wrap up. What's its objective? Well, it's it's a topical question because we were just asking Mike Ainsley, the chief executive of IBRC, that, and it said that on their briefing notes they handed out said 2020 is the day they have to be gone. But one of the things they're doing in the background is is tracker mortgages are sitting on the on the books of AIB and the firm of TSB, and they're loss making. They're making no money, and burning money for those banks. So there's talk now that as part of the restructuring of the promissory notes, that they take out the promissory notes out of Anglo and Nationwide and put in trackers because both are assets. And funny enough, the trackers at AIB and permanent TSB are about 34 billion. Uh, so it's kind of a neat match between the figures involved. And uh, the issue with the tracker mortgages is that they're, they don't make money, but they're not bad. They're being repaid. So there's money coming in at them. It's just that the reason they're not profitable is, is that the banks lend at a lend at, borrow at a particular rate and they charge at another and instead of being like that, they're like that, so they're not making any money on them. But they are they could be used as a way of both fixing the IBRC problem and um, and also fixing the AIB and permanent TSB problem. And if you get them out of those two banks you may encourage investors to come in. To answer your question, the debate now is well if IBRC gets tracker mortgages, some of those won't fall due to be fully repaid until the twenty thirties. So IBRC will be around for a lot longer. But the uh, different talks we've had, people have different kind of analysis of why we have a crisis. Let's say Conor McCabe seemed to think that it was a particularly Irish version of capitalism. And Ronan Lyons said that it was kind of a classic property bubble. <coughs> a lot of people will put it down to Anglo. And when you look at Anglo, do you think the failure was the relationship banking model? Was it um, just people being a bit reckless? Was it a lack of regulation? Why did it blow up so much? I mean, it's happened in other countries at the same time. Similar things, but not to this extent. But what was it uniquely about Anglo? Well, it is depressing that it's a kind of classic property bubble. It's, there's not, it's not that complicated what happened here. I mean, uh, there's no kind of derivatives or um, CDOs or CLOs or any of the stuff that's taken down a few of the American banks. It's just a plain old property crash. Um, I think in terms of the scale of the problem here, Patrick Honan has said the scale of the problem is, is four times worse here than in other European countries. I suppose leaving Greece aside for different reasons, but um, the scale of the crisis here was four times worse uh, than, than the market on the average. And for that reason, you know, it's much more of a domestic issue and you can't blame Lehman Brothers or, or international factors to what happened here. 
but I, I don't really, I, I don't kind of buy into the whole, is it a particular type of capitalism? I think there's one type of capitalism and there's extremes within it in terms of you know, how, how a government sets up a regulator to regulate a particular capital, to regulate capitalism in your country. And I think what happened here was a variety of factors. I think the, if you're asking legally who's to blame, you could lay the blame first and foremost at the, at the door of the banks. Um, and then I think a government before a regulator, because I think the government should have oversight over the regulator. Um, and I think that if you only give the regulator certain tools, then you're kind of, you're, 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 you're tying one hand behind your back in terms of what they can do with the banks. Also, I think the regulator was too close to the banks. Just like Anglo was too close to its customers, the regulator was far too close to the banks. And this, like touch regulation or principles-based regulation, or a better way of describing it is regulation for grown-ups. We're going to have a little code here on the wall. We want you to go and look at it every week just to tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing. That's the extent of our involvement as a regulator. I mean, that's no good either. Um, but I think that, uh, I think what the banks, and what particularly Anglo did here is, it convinced people that it had established a new secure form of banking that was incredibly profitable. And others believed it, the other banks believed it, and then everyone else believed it because the money they were making. And I think that that kind of turned Irish banking on its head a bit. And, um, but again, like if you look at the UK, RBS and HBOS, um, and there was a report into what happened in the commercial banking division of Lloyds, which, uh, it's primarily HBOS. They they say all the same things that happened in Anglo. Too close, too many, uh, too many, too much lending to a very small number of people, and you were too close to them. And that's the problem. The concentration. I mean, concentration just kills uh, in banking, and you spread your risk. You know, if you're an investor, you don't buy twenty eight percent of Anglo Irish Bank, and that's why the losses are so great for some people. Um, just as an investor, you spread your risk. It's simple. Stuff. But I think we had, we took it to a different level in this country. Sorry. Do you think, for instance, right from a struggling blame, you know, your last point there, you take it to a different level. Could it have been a large part, or one major reason why that was, Anglo wasn't a retail, a high street retail bank. I mean, it didn't deal with customers off the street. It, it dealt with uh, basically investors, I think. I, I remember when they used to have it down in the Irish Times, but played, you know, over the right hand corner. Mm. And nobody knew who they were. It just looked a nice picture. But um, that they, if they would have been, surely been watched more closely or supervised from outside more closely if they had been in with the retailers or somebody would have heard earlier what was going on. Uh, I mean, the regulators might have had more experience to be able to, to observe what was going on there than before. Could that have been a part of it? Do you think that they weren't your normal? Uh, thing. I, I just remember that you were talking about lawyers earlier on. Uh, in the beginning of my career, I worked in the merchant banking liquidation, which is very long running uh, liquidation, and um, uh, I was very junior. But uh, people used to say that he, he ran that bank, the person involved, uh, as his own private bank, but he just mm. the time around Dublin. And it's and Patrick Gallagher. It seemed that they had been doing yeah. something fairly similar. I, I don't know what you'll do, and can't be very things at all, or, or could you do something you know what I'm saying? Well, I think that's. Um, uh, I, th I think that the regulator was certainly hands off when it came to Anglo, um, and it was too late when it did react. The, t the two things that the regulator did that it would say now, well, we did these things and you know we, we attempted to take the heat out of the market. They told the banks, regulators in principle based regulation, they really only measure they can do is say, well, if you're going to do that kind of lending, we want to force you to put more aside in reserve in case those loans go bad. But would you trust an Irish government to supervise a regulator properly, as you have said? Would much better have Mrs. Merkel do it? She doesn't trust us to do it, or any other government probably do it. Could uh, be observed from our regulator from abroad to make this regulator? Well, there was talk of this kind of European wide yeah, regulator, the and the European Banking Authority, which is supposed to be doing stress tests, is coming through into all sorts of trouble and it's woefully understaffed. I think there's only 40 people working in London. So, you know, people said things in the crisis and what we need to do, but I mean, they're not following through and responding. I mean, there's talks now, you know, people saying at conferences as well, you know, uh, and privately, people saying, oh, we can't have a knee jerk reaction, a kind of over regulation. So, well, I think we can. I think 63 billion is an awful lot. Uh, a big price to pay for. Uh, I'm pointing in judgment, it's generally a bit of everywhere. Um, and, and because there are civil servants are appointing, that they appoint somebody who they know would not be able to go to the peaks to do anything anyway, so they can get on with government themselves. Yeah, I think you've got to establish a proper regulator, and you know, regulation is set up by legislation, and government legislates. Yeah, this is just, thank you very much, Simon, for your presentation. It's so technical and everything. On a lighter tone, I was just wondering, do we know who the ten golden circle? Yeah, we do. If I could name them now, I'd be doing well. 
Paddy McKinnon is one of them who's been sued by the Barclay Brothers over in, sorry, he's suing the Barclay Brothers over in uh, London at the moment. He's won. Jerry Gannon, um, Sean Riley, um, Joe O'Reilly, uh, the Dundrum Shopping Centre guy. Uh, <laughs> other names on it. Uh, there's a, a, a auctioneer up in Malahide. Um, I don't know, because this has been recorded. <laughs> um, it's in the book, somewhere. The... Um, they're kind of the, they were described as kind of the loyal customers or long standing customers. And do they actually pay physical cash or these paper trails a day? No, loans. Okay. Just loans. They got loans to buy the shares. Uh, Brian O'Farrell is the auctioneer. Uh, he owns the Northside Shopping Centre in Coolock. Um, Jerry Maguire owns the Lawrence Centre in Shopping Centre in Drogheda. Patrick Carney, a Belfast based property developer. Um, the Seamus Ross. Uh, Menley Holmes, John McCabe, um, uh, Jerry Gannon, I said that. Yeah, that's them. That's them. Thank you. And are they being followed? They, as I, as, as I understand it, are witnesses, not suspects. So they're, they're, they're not the focus of the investigations, but they're, in other words, it's not you that they did anything wrong. But they haven't been paid for well, the loans were given on a non-recourse basis, meaning, well, 50, uh, a quarter of the loan was recourse, which is, so you're on the hook for a quarter. So each of them got about 45 million, so just over 10. On the securitizing, on the securitization, you're saying that it just so happens 34, I presume is that million or billion? Billion, all billion. billion. 34 no billion. more millions sure. anymore. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's just about, yeah, 34 billion, it matches another one to do that's just I mean it's a neat coincidence but it could possibly help the solution but two questions on that is it was the securitisation and the collateral was behind it that caused the financial crash around the world in other words people people kept on selling mortgages to mortgages to third parties etc and the assumption here is that the securitisation of the tracker mortgages will actually produce what is supposed to be on paper producing so that's question number one. So there's a risk there. But number two, why do the banks or the lenders on tracker bonds not allow an individual to pay off these 25-year loans if they so say they won the lottery without at a proper discounted value, net present value on it? Yeah. Well, I think they're going to come around to that. Uh, some of the banks have been saying. Uh, some of the banks were offering deals to customers privately, case by case, and. But only if you're in trouble, not if somebody just wanted to get out of it. Yeah, well, I think that eventually they'll come round to that. I think that if you have a tracker mortgage, the banks don't want to do it because, again, it's an admission of a problem and a mistake that they made by selling these things. They would say, well, you know, we're going to mix, we're going to lose, we're going to lose 100 grand on your mortgage. Tell you what, we'll pay you 25 grand if you come off the tracker then and go to another institution or, you know, we'll help you get, find a loan elsewhere. Uh, I think those deals will eventually have to come about. It's 34 billion of loans and that have a much longer life than some of the property and development loans. So you have to deal with them. In terms of the securitization question, I don't think it applies here because you're talking about swapping loans around three institutions that are already owned by the state. So if they weren't owned by the state, I'd say that's a, a, a relevant concern. Oh, securitization got us into this trouble. Why are you shuffling from one institution to the other? We own them all. It doesn't matter. Yeah, just to come back to the early part of the lecture. Thanks, I enjoyed it. Um, was the turnover developments, and uh, was that related partly to the capital gains tax? Why they did that? Um, um, secondly, just the the um, savings to lending ratio. What was the impetus, impetus to change that? Um, which was back in the end of the nineties or beginning of the of the new decade. And then in relation to uh, the type of capitalism here, isn't a particular type in the sense of like closeness of Fianna Fáil and the developers and so on, and there's some of the motivation in there, a culture of mm. of uh, easy, poor regulation and also in terms of being a, what would you call it, like uh, not offshore but um, uh, low, low tax rate and so mm. on. And finally, that's a bit too much. In, in terms of Europe, in the sense of that they, because they make mistakes, both politically and economically, um, 
they don't want contagion, they don't want the banks to fail, essentially then they're going to make the ordinary people, particularly in Ireland, to pay for it. Uh, yeah, that's that's basically it, uh, that they're, we have to pay for it because uh, we borrowed it. There's a Could I just, uh, sorry for going, does that not make the political arrangement corrupt? Really? Corrupt? Uh, I don't know about that word, but... I guess this is, you know, if you think about the European Central Bank is largely influenced by German policymakers, um, both central bankers and, again, the view of how um, the crisis should be worked through is based on the fact that you pay back everything you owe unless you can't. And this is the whole debate about debt sustainability and whether we can or cannot repay it. Um, and this is why the restructuring of the notes are going ahead. Um, I think that... Uh, is it corrupt? I don't think it's corrupt. I think that there's a fear that we could go back to a point where the crisis would start kick off again and the contagion can't be stopped. That's the fear, that if you start saying, well, okay, Ireland can burn senior bondholders, and then suddenly a French bank blows up and says, well, they're going to burn senior bondholders. And then suddenly when the banking market is kind of trying to, on the verge of recovery, it can't recover at all if that happens. I mean, I think you're talking about, you're looking at the whole kind of fabric of oh, yeah, capitalism. Well, I think that if you assume that you can only fix the system with the system you have, you, you do everything to protect the system. That's why they're not, sorry. What uh, effect did the rating agencies have in the whole crisis? Did they have any effect on the Irish system? Oh, well, absolutely. They, they would have given Anglo a AAA rating in the early noughties, like 2003-2004, and with that, Anglo went to the banks in Europe and said, we've a AAA rating, uh, Ireland has a AAA rating, we're good for it, we'll get your money back, uh, can you give us money to do all the lending we want to do? And they played a key role, um, and then I suppose it's more international issue with credit rating agencies that they didn't, I think the credit rating agencies did point to the fact that Ireland had a big exposure to property, much like the central bank did, although uh, you need a degree in central bank speak to understand what they said sometimes, but I think the credit rating agencies did point out some of the uh, potential landmines in Ireland with property. Internationally, they didn't. They gave AAA ratings to bundles of loans that they had no idea what was in those loans. Yeah. Okay, folks, I think we're going to finish it up there. Thanks very much. Sir. Thanks, sir.